Okay, so today I'll talk about this paper by Benabu and Tirol uh, on intrinsic motivation. Yes, and uh, it's uh, going to give us some insight into the kind of phenomena that I was talking about last time. So if you remember the daycare experiments uh, and, and the nuclear waste facility. So there, uh, when incentives were strengthened, people were given more of a reward for doing something or a penalty for not doing something. Uh, the actual behavior went in the opposite direction from what we would expect, right? So penalties increase bad behavior and uh, uh, rewards uh, diminished good behavior, right? So that's not what we usually expect. So what could be the reason? So this, this uh, paper gives us uh, one st possible story. So um, let me talk about the paper. So here's the broad idea, and then we'll look at the model. Yeah, uh, there's no team production, right? So we come back from the team aspect of it. So it's still individual production. And we have a standard kind of moral hazard problem that the agent's effort is not observable. And so how does the principal create some incentive for uh, high levels of effort? Now, one critical assumption, this is, you know, if one were to sort of pick out uh, an assumption which sets this paper uh, aside from your textbook uh, moral hazard theory, is the second bullet point. Okay, so Benabu and Tirol, they assume that the agent has some intrinsic motivation. That is to say, in some circumstances, even if no reward is on offer, the agent may have some reason to work hard. The agent values the output or production uh, to some extent for its own sake, right? Um, and um, so if, if so there's a project in which the agent is going to work and if the project is successful, regardless of monetary payments, uh, success of the project, uh, of course, creates some benefits for the principal, uh, but it also creates some benefits for the agent. And these are intrinsic benefits, right? Um, what do I have in mind? Think of the following story. Uh, say there's a cricket coaching camp Yes, and young uh, kids are being trained by a cricket coach. Um, so if they train hard and work hard at the nets, uh, they may be very successful. For example, uh, the, the kid may go on to play for India, right? And if that happens, then of course the coach uh, derives some satisfaction or maybe some professional acclaim, more business for the coaching center, what have you. Uh, but the but the kid also gets some benefits, right? The kid gets a good career, gets the becomes famous, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's some intrinsic motivation for the kid to to work hard. But that may not be enough, right? So the coach is thinking of offering a reward, like you know, if you if you make it to the India team, I'll give you a car or a bike or something of that sort, or some uh, you know good sum of money. So the coach is the principal and the young uh, trainee is the, is the agent in this situation. Now, here's the other critical assumption. Uh, Benabu and Tirol assume that uh, the productivity of the production function or the promise of this uh, young cricketer uh, is observable to the coach, but not to the cricketer himself. Yes. Um, so in standard moral hazard uh, models, this is not the assumption. All the private information lies with the agent. The principal is uninformed and the principal is trying to write a contract which will make the best of the situation. So here we have what is called an informed principal problem. Uh, the coach can tell who has the promise to be the next Tendulkar or Virat Kohli uh, and who doesn't, who can be just an ordinary cricketer, right? So the coach has talent spotting ability, and what it translates into is an informed principle problem. Now, 
why can't the coach just tell you know the 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 young cricketer who who's potentially the next Kohli? Why doesn't the coach take him aside and tell him that oh you're the next Kohli? Well, that's because of uh, a credibility problem on the coach's side, which is that you know the coach wants everyone to work hard and do their best. So even somebody who's not a Kohli. Uh, the coach has reason to say that you know you uh, uh, you're the next superstar, so so work very hard in the nets, uh, and and the benefit for the coach is that you know this guy could at least go and play Ranji Trophy or, or you know IPL or something like that, and the coach will derive some benefits from that. So the coach has an incentive to exaggerate. So basically, the coach does not internalize the agent's cost, the cost of working long hours in the nets. Uh, that's a cost borne by the agent, by the young cricketer, not by the coach, right? And that is what is creating a conflict. And so if the, if the coach, the informed principal tells the agent that, you know, your high ability, uh, there's a credibility issue. Even medium ability or low ability people can be, you know, the coach has reason to tell them that they're high ability. Okay, so in so so these are the two major assumptions. Keep in mind these are the two sort of key features which are novel, which is introduced in the model of moral hazard. One is intrinsic motivation, and the other is the informed principal nature of the problem. Yes. Um, so how can the coach um, solve this problem? What what is the best thing the coach can do? Uh, the coach can provide some extrinsic motivation. Right, which can take the form either of a flat wage or bonus. In particular, a bonus is what is supposed to, you know, in standard moral hazard theory, that is what generates incentives. That uh, if, if the agent is paid uh, or given a reward in the, in the event of a success, so that is what we can call extrinsic motivation. It's, it's something which has been created from the outside. It, it takes the form of, you know, uh, monetary uh, uh, penalties or uh, rewards. Now, what is different here is that the extrinsic motivation affects performance in two different ways. One is the standard way that, you know, there's incentive. So if the coach says that you'll get a shiny car if you make it to the Indian team, that itself is creating some motivation, which is, which is fairly standard. But what the coach offers and what kind of contract the coach offers or the principal offers to the agent also conveys information about what the coach knows or at least potentially conveys information the the agent who's uninformed about his own productivity may infer something from the kind of deal that he's getting from the coach right and that is a second channel through which the contract affects performance and that is the thing that we want to understand here and the broad idea is going to be the following that extrinsic motivation may sometimes crowd out intrinsic motivation right that uh, and through this second channel that if the coach is not careful about what kind of wages or bonuses or shiny cars or bikes that he offers as incentive sometimes it may be that you know the 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 bonus uh, generates some incentives but it conveys very negative information about productivity about prospects right and that second effect may be stronger and that's when bonuses can be counterproductive so that's the story. So let's see exactly how it works, how the model works. Yeah. Any questions? Sir, how is it uh, uh, over the, I didn't get how extrinsic motivation is creating the negative effect because overall utility would be higher only right, for the agent. Let's, let's, let's look at the details of the model and then we'll come back and review these conceptual points, right? I just wanted to give, at this point, it won't be absolutely precise because you know, we need to look at the model to, to understand it precisely, but, but we'll return to, to these highlights, yeah. Okay, so here's a model. The agent, uh, agent's effort level can take two values, zero and one. Zero is like you know, not working hard and one is uh, working hard, putting in long hours, etc. And the cost of uh, effort level one is C. Effort level zero is of course costless. Now, if the agent chooses zero effort, then there's no chance of success, right? Whatever be the talent or the productivity of the agent, effort is necessary, but it, it's not sufficient. 
So the way we model that is to say that, well, uh, in, if, if the agent chooses zero effort, there's a zero probability of success. If the agent chooses effort one, then there's some probability theta of success. However, this is different for different agents. It's different for different uh, uh, young cricketers in the, in the academy, right? Some of them has a high probability of success if they work hard, that's theta eight. These are the Virat Kohli's of the future. And others are the ordinary guys and they have a lower probability of success when they work hard. That's given by theta L, all right? Now for a random cricketer in the academy, uh, the probability that they're the high, more talented type, uh, that the high probability types, high types is given by alpha, right? So alpha is that I'm, I'm potentially a Kohli, one minus alpha is that I'm not, I'm just, ordinary. So the principal will get to see theta because of his special uh, insights. And the agent gets a noisy signal about his type, whether he's high type or low type. Think of the noisy signal to, to follow the example, the running example. The noisy signal is like, you know, how, how many runs the agent has scored, the young cricketer has scored in, let's say, school matches. Yeah. Or how many centuries they have scored. Uh, so higher value of sigma means that they have scored more runs in, in preparatory school matches. Uh, one assumption which is very standard in moral hazard models is what is called the monotone likelihood property, right? The idea is that higher values of the signal or uh, bigger scores in the school matches are more likely to come from the high type rather than the low type. And so this ratio, which is, so, so the signal distribution, right? If it's a high type, the high type uh, has some, it's a probability, probabilistic function, how many times, uh, how many runs the high type will score in school matches. Uh, and similarly, there's a distribution for the low type and these are the density functions, right? So the ratio of the density functions, which is like some sort of relative probability of scoring sigma, that is increasing with sigma, right? So if you see a, a kid scoring a century, there's some probability, you know, this, is, this was scored by a high type. If it's a double century, then there's a higher probability that this was scored by a high type, right? Relatively, there's a higher probability. That's the idea. And so if we do Bayesian updating, right? Uh, after observing sigma, when the agent is updating his beliefs about whether he's a high type or low type, right? He'll, his, his posterior probability that he's a high type will be higher, the higher is sigma, the higher is the number of score and runs he scored in the school matches, right? That's what follows from this monotone likelihood property. Everybody clear about that? Okay, so here comes the next part. If the sir, sir, yes. uh, sir, signal is noisy means like a uh, sigma is a process which is not like a forecastable, right? We cannot forecast it, the, the no, future movements so of sigma. It's, sigma is a random variable, but the distribution of sigma depends on the type of the agent, right? High types, roughly speaking, have uh, sigma distribution, which is more skewed to the right relative to the other type, right? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. thank you. So, thank so, you. Yeah, so the technical meaning will be more, uh, you know, you can understand it better if you keep in mind the example that I'm talking about, that, uh, uh, that the relative probability of scoring a double century for the high type, uh, for the high type, the relative probability of scoring a double century is higher than the relative probability of scoring just a century, right? That's the kind of assumption. So, and, so uh, one other question. Uh, so uh, probability of success if the agent spends effort theta belongs to the set theta H and theta L, right? So theta can take two values, high or low. Yes. So the pr principal learns theta and agent gives a noisy signal. Like uh, principal lance theta, like he uh, lance theta for sure or uh, 
it is the probability that sigma is the probability that he loves theta. Okay, right. let me clarify that. So the principal right at the outset knows the true value of theta, right? Okay. That is to say the coach knows that if this guy works hard, what are his chances of making it to the Indian team, right? For the talented people, he can spot them and he can tell that their theta is high, theta H, right? And for the less talented people, he can spot that their theta is theta L. So the principal doesn't have to look at the noisy signal sigma. The principal knows before that what the value of theta is for, for a particular uh, trainee. The agent himself doesn't know what the value of theta is. So the agent gets some information by observing sigma, right? So the young cricketer learns something uh, by looking at how many runs he scored in the school matches. The principal has special insight. The principal doesn't have to be, the principal is not swayed or influenced by, by the realization of sigma because the principal can, can tell right from the beginning uh, whether it's theta H or theta L for this guy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How is, how is sigma different from alpha? How is sigma different from alpha? Alpha is the prior probability. So, so the uh, so as I said, uh, the coach or the principal knows the value of theta right from the beginning. What is the value of theta? Is the probability of success if if uh, the effort choice is one. All right. Now, in the beginning, the young cricketer, the agent, is wondering: Is my theta high or low? Okay. Even before he has observed the signal sigma, even before he has played the school matches, uh, he's wondering whether it's high or low, right? So he'll have some belief about whether it's high. And that belief is captured by sigma, uh, sorry, by alpha, right? So before even the school matches take place, uh, the, the agent believes that with probability alpha, he's a high type, with probability one minus alpha, he's a low type. Now, after that, subsequently, this noisy signal is generated when the school matches take place, right? And at that point, uh, he gets additional information. Initially, his belief is alpha that I'm a high type. After observing sigma, he updates that belief. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so if the uh, task is successfully completed, the principal gets a pair of W, right? This, these payoffs are just given. Uh, and the agent gets a pay of V. And V is strictly positive, And this is the intrinsic motivation part. Right in your standard textbook moral hazard model, V is usually zero. It's the principal who has a stake, uh, and and the agent does not have a stake in in you know the output of the firm or what have you, whatever production process is engaged in, and that's why stakes have to be artificially created through bonuses and stuff like that. Uh, but here there is some stake. So even if the principal doesn't offer a prize, the agent, if he's successful, will walk away with this payoff V. Yes. So that provides him some amount of incentive, uh, just uh, exogenously. Yeah. Now, um, now the principal can offer a flat wage or a bonus. To begin with, we'll only think of bonuses, right? Because uh, because standard moral hazard theory tells us that flat wages have no effect on incentives, right? If I have, if some part of my compensation is guaranteed, whether I succeed or fail in, in what I'm doing, uh, then even if that amount, that flat wage is very, uh, very big, uh, it will not motivate me to work hard. What will motivate me to work hard is uh, contingent payments, right? Performance based payments. So, so, Initially, we'll just consider a, bon a bonus, right? And so the principal can say that, well, if you succeed, I will pay you this bonus. That's like the, like the fancy car, if you will. Right? If you make it to the Indian team, I, you'll get the B. And the principal chooses B, so it's endogenous. So let's see what the optimal contract is going to look like. But before that, let's put in place uh, three assumptions on the on the parameters of the model to make it interesting, right? Uh, so that so that the kind of effect that we are talking about actually does arise. So the first assumption is this, right? This is saying that uh, the cost of effort lies between these two: theta l times v, theta h times v. What are these objects? 
if the agent knew for sure that he's a high type, right, then he his expected uh, uh, payoff from working hard without any bonus put on the table, his expected payoff from working hard is this. We'll, we'll assume everybody's risk neutral, right? So theta h times v with this probability success succeeds and whenever he succeeds, he gets the v. So for the high type, this is greater than c. But for the low type, this is the opposite. So this is basically saying that the, if the agents were not uninformed about their talent, about their type, then if, if they knew, then the high types will have enough intrinsic motivation to work hard, but the low types will fall short. They will choose zero effort and these guys will choose high effort. So we want to make the problem interesting, right? If, if, if for example, the cost was uh, less than both of these, then the principal doesn't have to worry. Then the principal, anyway, you know, the, the agent will work hard, even if he didn't know his type. He knows that even in case he's a low type, uh, there is enough uh, to earn uh, from hard work. Okay, here's the second example. The second example, uh, sorry, the second assumption. The second assumption writes down this inequality. This expression on the right-hand side is what we may call B star, right? What is B star? B star is basically the minimal uh, bonus which will make a low type work hard. So suppose the agent has learned somehow that he's a low type, right? This inequality tells us that he will choose zero effort. So the principal has to offer to sweeten the deal, at least to some extent, right? To, to offer a bonus to, to cover this gap, yes? And that bonus is B star. It's the minimal uh, bonus that will make a low type work hard. And the assumption is that W is less, uh, greater than B star. So, so this bonus is worth paying for the principal, right? <clears throat> so let me uh, quickly show you why this inequality implies what I'm saying it does. Okay, so if the agent has somehow learned that he's a, he's a low type, and if he doesn't, if he's not being offered a bonus, then what is his expected payoff from hard work? It's uh, theta L times V minus C, right? And this is negative by our assumption. Now, if the principal offers a bonus of B, you know, B, then the, a low type agent's expected payoff becomes, uh, sorry, becomes with probability theta L, he succeeds. And when he succeeds, he gets his intrinsic motivation payoff, which is V, and he also gets the bonus, which is B, right? So that minus C has to be greater than or equal to zero. You have to choose B large enough so that this is greater than or equal to zero. So what is the minimum value of B, which will make it non-negative? That comes from this equality right and so if you take c to the other side uh, you, you basically end up getting that the minimum bonus that will work is uh, uh, c divided by theta l minus v right and um, so keep in mind that expression and so that bonus has to be less than W. Otherwise, the principal has no reason to offer it. He doesn't gain from it. Um, finally, we make some assumption on alpha. What is alpha? Alpha is the initial belief of, of the agent that he's a high type, right? So you can think of that as the agent's self-confidence to begin with, right? And we have to make an assumption on alpha being not too high. Because if alpha was very high, the expected payoff of the agent from working hard, right? Even if he learns nothing about his ability or the principal doesn't convey any, convey any information, the agent's expected payoff is alpha times theta h plus one minus alpha, so theta hv 
plus one minus alpha theta LV, right? Minus cost, this is his net payoff. Now we have assumed that theta H times V is greater than the cost and theta L times V is less than the cost. So if alpha were very high, this will turn out to be positive anyway, right? The agent feels that the chance that he's a high type, he's the next Coley is, is substantial. In that case, the principal can just sit back. He doesn't have to re really generate any incentives. Yeah. So we are ruling that out, that absent any uh, intervention by the principal, any kind of reward from the principal, uh, the agent, so, so we are assuming this inequality is actually the opposite. So that means the agent left to his own devices will not find enough reason to work hard. So something has to be done by the principal. Questions? Okay, so we have the assumptions. Everybody clear about the model? Yeah? All right. Uh, first observation. Uh, you might say that, okay, look, the principal can do the following. For the high types, he doesn't offer any bonus because they're high types. So, you know, they have anyway, enough intrinsic motivation to work hard. So don't give them any bonus. For the low types, they don't have enough in intrinsic motivation, right? Uh, their expected payoff from working hard is, is less than their cost. Uh, so offer the bonus to the low types. So offer the bonus to the, to the ordinary trainees in the academy and don't offer Virat Kohli's, uh, the emerging Virat Kohli's any bonus, right? Because uh, they anyway will work hard if they learn that they're a high type. That won't work because of the credibility issue, right? So suppose we have a PB is a perfect Bayesian equilibrium. Everybody I'm sure is familiar, right? So that's a concept will, that's the extension of Nash equilibrium to games of incomplete information. It says that every type of every player should be playing a best response, right? So, so uh, I, I'll take it as given that you're familiar with it. Um, so, so suppose the principal strategy is this, offer no bonuses to the high types and uh, offer the minimum bonus B star to the low types. Well, it is not an equilibrium because the principal will want to deviate. So even if the principal say, sees somebody who's a low type, the principal wants this guy to work hard still, right? Make it to as far as he can go. So the principal can always pretend that to low types, he can pretend that they're actually high types by not giving them bonuses, right? If you, if you have a fully separating equilibrium, there's a profitable deviation by the principal, which is not to offer the bonus even to the low types. The low types will be misled into thinking that they're high types because they're not being given the bonuses. So they'll work hard anyway, and the principal will save some money, right? The bonus is saved. It doesn't have to pay it. So that kind of deviation will destroy a fully separating equilibrium, right? It does not exist. So what will happen? is the question, can, what kind of equilibrium can we construct? Yes. And we can construct a semi-separating equilibrium. So let me, let me specify, uh, tell you what that is. So here's the equilibrium that we'll find. Uh, when the agent is a high type, the principal doesn't offer a bonus, zero bonus. When the agent is a low type, the principal randomizes between offering a bonus and not offering a bonus, right? So with probability, X star, the principal offers the bonus B star, probability one minus X star, he does not, right? Sometimes he tries to fool the low types into by not offering them bonuses, but sometimes he does offer them bonuses, yes. The important question is what, has, what will the value of X star be to make this an equilibrium? And uh, if, you're, if you're you know, familiar with your mixed strategy equilibrium calculations, Whenever a player randomizes, the player has to be indifferent between the two options, right? So to find a mixed strategy equilibrium, we have to use that indifference property that, uh, so, so I'll get to that in a moment. So in our, the equilibrium that we are constructing, this is the principal strategy. What is the agent's strategy? The agent strategy is as follows. 
If the agent is offered a bonus, the agent always works hard, puts in effort of equal to one, right? And that's not hard to see that that'll be a best response because you know the bonus amount B star has been constructed so that even a low type, somebody who knows himself to be low type for sure, will, will be motivated to choose the high effort level because of the bonus. That, that's how this B star has been defined. But the agent strategy when he's not paid a bonus is to look at the noisy signal, to look at his score in the school matches and choose hard work only if the score exceeds some threshold value, sigma star, right? Now, once again, the sigma star is going to be endogenous to the construction of the equilibrium. We have to find the value of sigma star so that this whole construction works as an equilibrium. So the two critical things that we have to solve for are X star and sigma star, right? What is the probability that the principal will offer a bonus to a low type? And what is the threshold score that will motivate the agent to work hard if he is not on a bonus, okay? And here too, we'll have to use the indifference property. If whenever we have a threshold like this in a game, that means at the threshold, the agent must be indifferent between working hard and not working hard. So we'll exploit the indifference property from here, from the randomization of the principle that gives us one, uh, one equality, indifference prop uh, condition, and we'll get another equality, another indifference condition from the threshold. So those two equations will solve for these values. All right, so how do we find that? Um, so first of all, the agent will, um, so the agent will do some updating, right? And he has two sources of information potentially. One is what kind of contract he has been offered, whether he's been offered a bonus or not. And the second is Sigma the number of runs he has scored in the school matches. So he will update his belief from alpha to some pi. Pi will be endogenous, right? Let's fix pi for now, right? This is his expected payoff. After updating, when he's thinking, should I work hard? What, what is my expected uh, reward, uh, expected earnings from that? Uh, that's given by this, right? This times V and for an agent to be indifferent between working hard and not, this expected payoff should be equal to C, the cost of effort, right? And that gives us a specific value of pi, the posterior, if it takes a particular value given by this expression, then the agent will be indifferent between high level and low level of effort, yes? Now, next we come to how the posterior is formed and is formed by Bayes' rule. Okay, well, there are two cases. If the agent is offered a bonus, if you look at the principal strategy, if the agent is, is being offered a bonus, the principal offers a bonus only to some of the low types. None of the high types are, are offered bonuses. So the moment the bonus is, is, is on offer, pi becomes one. There's nothing to calculate really, right? Because, uh, but if no bonus is offered, if you look at the principal strategy, uh, no bonus on offer could mean it's a high type or a low type. We won't be able to, we won't be sure. The agent won't be sure because all high types are offered zero bonuses and some L types are offered zero bonuses. So it can happen to both types. So there we have to do a genuine Bayes rule calculation. So if the agent has uh, no, sees that he is not being offered the bonus, then he looks at the non runs he has scored, sigma. And this is Bayes rule gives him this, this value of pi, right? Why? Because this event that he doesn't have a boner and he has scored sigma or sigma star amount of runs that can arise in two ways, right? This is one event through which it arises. The other event, so, so this is when he's a, actually a high type and he scores this much run. And, uh, this is the event when he's actually low type uh, and when he's a low type uh, with probably X star, he's, he's not offered bonuses. 
And with this probability, he scores exactly sigma star runs, right? So Bayes rule gives us this. You can kind of look at it more closely and satisfy yourself that this is the right application of Bayes rule. So we can rewrite this expression like this, right? We divide numerator and denominator both by this term alpha times gh of sigma star. And so we have ones here. And this last term becomes this uh, ratio of priors of the two types times x star times this. And uh, r is basically the, the likelihood ratio. Okay. So if we replace this expression we have derived for pi up here, we have one equation, right? That's the indifference property of the agent that when he gets exactly sigma star, he should be indifferent between uh, working hard and not. So that's what one of our equations. Um, now, sir, sir, yes, sir, sir, will you explain again? Uh, how do we get the pi? Like, a, I don't understand the base rule calculation. This second part or the previous part? This yeah, uh, uh, it is written that uh, if pi is against uh, posterior on H, so I want to know how the pi is formed. Like, uh, how do we formulate it? This is Bayes' rule, right? So you have to remember Bayes' rule. So Bayes' rule tells us what? That uh, we are trying to calculate the posterior of something, what something, the, the, uh, that this is a high type, okay? So that's the posterior belief or probability we're trying to calculate. Conditional on an event that we have observed. Now, what is that event? The event is that the agent has been not offered a bonus first. And second, the agent has scored sigma star amount of runs. That's the realization of a noisy signal. So based on these two event, events, the agent will use Bayes rule to create, to do this probability calculation, right? So Bayes rule tells us that, you know, uh, the probability of him being a high type, posterior probability is going to be, uh, come from this formula, right? Or in the numerator, what do we have? We have, uh, the prior probability that this is a high type. And under that prob prior probability, what's the, uh, what's the probability that, you know, he won't be offered a bonus and he's called sigma star amount of runs. Yeah. Okay. In the denominator, we have this other term because the same event or observation could arise even if you were a low type, right? So that's gi that gives rise to this second term. One minus alpha, that probability he's a low type. Given that he's a low type, X star is the probability he won't be offered a bonus. And this is the probability that he'll score sigma star amount of Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Mayuk, uh, could you- Thank you, thank, thank, thank you, sir, mute I got it. Yeah, no, could you mute yourself? Uh, thanks. Okay, now, so this was the agent's indifference condition. Right? This guarantees, once we plug in this expression up here in the equation, the equation that we get guarantees that, uh, that the agent, when, he, uh, when there's no bonus on the table and he has scored exactly sigma star amount of runs, he's indifferent between the two choices. Right? Now, as I said, we'll also have the principles in indifference condition. The principle is supposed to randomize between offering a bonus and not offering bonus, yes? When, when the agent's type is low. This equality captures that indifference condition, right? So how do we understand that? The right-hand side is very simple. Uh, if the principal offered a bonus, his payoff would be W minus B star times the probability of success of the low type, which is theta L. So I'll tell you why I, the theta L doesn't appear here. Now, if the principal doesn't offer a bonus, then he doesn't have to pay anything, right? So his expected payoff will be W times the probability that the end, that, that success will happen. Now, what's the probability the success will, will happen? This is the probability that the agent's signal realization, even though he's a low type, will fall above the threshold, that he'll score enough runs in the 
in the school matches to think that he may be the next Kohli, right? So that's given by this. So that times theta L times W will be the principal's payoff if he avoids the bonus and just takes a gamble that, you know, let me let me just try uh, not offering any money. And if he, if he has success in the school matches, then he'll work hard anyway. So theta L appeared on both sides of the indifference condition, and that's why it canceled out. So I didn't bother to write it down. Yeah. Now, note that in this equality of the two unknowns, sigma star x star, only sigma star uh, uh, occurs here. So from this equation, we can solve for sigma star. This is the solution. And we can plug back that solution to the other equation to solve for x star, right? So it's a pretty easy thing to solve. It turns out that, you know, as you know, these kinds of signaling games often have multiple equilibria, but if you apply stronger solution concepts, not just perfect Bayesian equilibrium, but, you know, something like the intuitive criterion of Cho and Krebs, which you must have learned in, in signaling theory in the micro course. Uh, if, you, if you go beyond and apply stronger concepts, this happens to be the only equilibrium which survives. So it's really something to focus on. Now, uh, so let's review what, what this equilibrium, the qualitative features of this equilibrium, right? And what we learn by uh, analyzing this model this way. Um, one is the trust effect, okay? When the principal knows that this is our next superstar in the making, the next Virat Kohli, the principal just doesn't offer a bonus. Bonuses are only offered to some of the low types. The high types are never offered a bonus. That is a feature of the equilibrium. So that you can think of as a trust effect, right? And, and, and really the mechanism at play is that the principal is saying, so not offering a bonus is a vote of confidence. It's saying that you're so good that I don't have to motivate you. Right? I've taken the gamble that you yourself will get the sense that you're very good. In school matches, you will score double and triple centuries. I'm, I don't know that for sure, but I know you're good. And so I know that you're, you're likely to, you know, your talent will be, uh, will be apparent to yourself with very high chance. And I am showing a vote of confidence in, you know, by, by not offering opponents. Uh, and again, in words, this is the intuition that I just mentioned that um, when the agent is a high type, even though he's not offered a bonus, it's very likely that he'll receive good news. His signal realization will be high. So a bonus offer itself is actually bad news. It's the opposite. It's a confession from the principal or the coach that you're not, not that good. That's why I have to sweeten the deal. That's why I have to give you all this extrinsic motivation, right? So that's a very critical point. This equilibrium has this feature, this logic that, uh, that even before school matches are played out and the sigma gets realized at some interim stage, if the cricketer sees that the coach is trying to give him a lavish you know, bonus, that itself is bad news. That, that tells the agent that, oh, I'm a low type. High type, the colleagues in the making are never offered these sweeteners, right? And conversely, if no bonus is offered, he thinks he's not sure because some low types are also offered zero bonuses, but he thinks that it's more likely that he's a colleague. He still watches the cricket map, you know, the school test scores and the signal, but, but uh, no bonus on the, on the table is, is good news. Right. So you see the two aspects of bonus playing out, right? In itself, the bonus is some amount of incentive, but if the bonus also carries bad news, that's a negative effect on, on the incentive to work hard, right? So as I said, uh, this independent noisy signal is very important because, because the logic is that the, the, the way the principal is uh, showing confidence, showing faith in the agent is by 
taking a gamble that he, this noisy signal realization will be high anyway. He'll score a lot of runs in the school matches. So if that avenue of uh, information wasn't there, then this whole story wouldn't work. And the other aspect is this intrinsic motivation, right? In standard model has the models V equal to zero. So there's no intrinsic motivation. There everybody has to be motivated through bonuses, right? This, this kind of gaming that by not offering bonuses, ironically, I, I provide some good news to the agent. That sort of thing won't work. You need a positive V, you need some amount of intrinsic motivation for, for the story to work there. Okay, uh, what else do we learn? Um, the outcome isn't first best, right? Under our assumptions, under those three inequalities, in a full information world, where agents know their types from the beginning, the principal will not give a bonus to the high type, the principal will offer a bonus to all the low types, all the high types will work hard because they have enough intrinsic motivation, all the low types will work hard because of the bonus. Right? So everybody will work hard and that's efficient. In this model, you get some inefficiency, right? Because high types are not offered bonuses and some of the low types. And in some of those cases, the signal falls below sigma star and then they stop working hard, right? So although it's efficient for everyone to choose effort level one, some agents, some high types and some low types don't choose that effort level. So that's an inefficiency, right? Um, and actually the inefficiency can actually be greater when the productivity is high, because remember that for all the high type agents, uh, the, the principal doesn't offer any bonus at all. So all of them are watching their signals, sigma, right? In, for all the high types, the principal is taking a gamble and, and sometimes the gamble fails and they, they uh, may not work hard. Uh, one feature here is this inefficiency arises because of the profit motive of the principal. Okay, what does that mean? Suppose the principal was a benevolent social planner whose motives were not in doubt. Suppose the uh, social planner or the principal was purely motivated by overall social surplus by, you know, by trying to create as much efficiency as possible. And then the credibility problem wouldn't be there. So even though the agent didn't know his type, this kind of benevolent planner, given his benevolence and given that it's known to the agent, could just say that, well, I'll offer bonuses to all the low types and no bonuses to all the high types. And this is believed. And if that were believed, then the efficiency would be restored, right? So, so inefficiency is arising because the principle is being selfish and, and uh, manipulative, right? The principle is trying to just maximize his own payoff, avoid paying out money. And that profit motive is what is creating this inefficiency. You see this conflict between profit motives and efficiency under incomplete information in a lot of uh, models that you may have seen in development economics, for example, right? Uh, tendency contracts and, and stuff like that. Okay, uh, some other points which are important to note. Uh, um, Suppose you were trying to test these sorts of theories, right? Um, now suppose uh, one way to test is to sort of go out, look at actual firms, actual projects, actual labor contracts, gather data from them and test the theory based on that data, right? So if the question is, do bonuses improve performance, right? You could gather some data. In some data points, bonuses were offered. In some, they were not offered, right? You gather that from actual business practice. 
right, from actually what, what employers did and uh, how em employees performed. And if you do that, you may actually find a negative correlation between, and if the world was according to this model, right? And if you took real world data, you, would, you, you could very well find a negative correlation between bonuses and performance, right? Do you see that? Anyone? Why would it be a negative uh, relationship? So if you did a scatter plot or whatever, ransom regression using some controls, your coefficient may be negative, that, you know, suggesting that higher bonuses lead to lower performance. But what kind of interpretation should we make there? That negative correlation could be because of a selection effect, right? If you think of the equilibrium, uh, and again, if, if this model captures the sort of world of you know, employment and labor contracts uh, well, then what's going on is that when the agents are less productive, when probability of success is low, so expected productivity is low, precisely, that, precisely in those cases, bonuses are offered more often. So for example, to give a parallel example, you know, take the classic question that if, you, if, if the government puts more uh, police on the streets, right? Will that reduce crime or not? Okay. Now, if you just look at the raw data, you may actually find a positive correlation between police presence, neighborhoods where there were more cops and the crime in the neighborhood. Why? You because could... police is employed in places only where crime are. Yes, because assignment of police is not random. In peaceful neighborhoods, the police department doesn't send too, too many police to patrol them. Police patrols are sent precisely to the neighborhoods where, where crime rates are high, right? And that can, because of that selection effect, you could end up seeing a positive correlation. And from that, if you infer that, you know, more police presence encourages crime, or over here, that higher bonuses discourage work, uh, directly, then that would be a mistake, right? Sir, uh, could it be because the bonuses are given right away and are not contingent on performance? Could that no, no, be no, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. The bonuses are contingent on performance. This B that I'm talking about up to this point is a contingent bonus, right? So it is only paid out when the project ends up being a success, right? In terms of the story, the, the coach is saying that you'll get the car if you make it to the Indian team, not otherwise. Oh, okay, sir. I'm just... Yeah. Uh, sir? Yes. When bonuses are given out in companies, usually everybody sort of gets a bonus. So, irrespective of your potential. I mean, your potential will eventually lead you to working harder or doing better work and therefore receiving a higher bonus if employees are ranked. So, why is it that globally we see a, we see a negative relationship? No, it's sometimes the bonuses are team-based, right? The whole team gets a bonus if a team has done very well. And, and you know, in many cases, uh, individual performance may not be measurable. And then like in the Holmstrom and Hermelin sort of framework, um, you know, that framework may apply to many companies, not all companies. Uh, but you do also see a lot of individualized uh, performance pay, right? You have know, things like, you know, employee of the month. If you go to these restaurant, McDonald's or whatever, uh, I, you'll have employee of the month, you'll have, you know, best price, whatever, you know, you have uh, stuff like that. So, so, um, so you also have individually customized uh, bonuses uh, in a lot of cases, in a lot of cases. You have Sorry. things like merit pay, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So Which, on an aggregate, it possibly means that uh, giving out bonuses, it, it could also mean that the process of giving out bonuses in companies is not particularly great if they are giving out higher bonuses to individuals who are not doing that well, or at least on an aggregate level, that's what it looks like. So it no, could also be a... There, there may be a terminological confusion here. By a bonus, I genuinely mean a bonus, right? 
Uh, now, some company may call a flat pay a bonus, right? Some pay which happens automatically every year, regardless of how, how they have done. That includes but, right. a salary also. I mean, the... the so, I'm um, talking of, I'm talk, talking of, I'll, I'll talk of flat salaries in a moment, right? So, I'm making a distinction between fat salaries, flat salaries, uh, and, and genuine bonuses, genuine performance pay at the individual level. Right. If individual productivity is observable, then there is uh, uh, some some individualized uh, pay. Right. Think of employee of the month. Right. That's absolutely. I mean, that can go to only one person, not to the whole team, the whole uh, group in the restaurant. Right. So that's an example of an individualized bonus. Yes. Uh, and 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 presumably it's based on some sort of performance index. Yeah. Uh, sales agents have commissions, right? It's absolutely tied to how many they themselves individually, how, what their sales figures are in a month. So, so their contract may have like, you know, 10% commission or 15% commission. So that's another example of a bonus from the real world, right? So, so I'm saying that if you, if you collect data from the real world, let's say sales, you have a data set of salespeople. Some of them had 20% commission, some had 5% commission, some had no commission, some had just flat salaries. Now, if it's the real world data, then what might happen is that you may see a negative correlation, right? Uh, but that could arise only because, you know, those big bonuses, the 20% bonuses, as opposed to five or 0% bonuses are paid out when the prospects are bleak, whether of the agent or of that particular uh, company or, or outlet, yes? That's why they had to sweeten the deal and, and give a very high bonus to, to motivate them strongly. Um, so that's happening through the selection effect. So if you want to identify whether uh, other things equal, Saturday's paribus, bonuses motivate people to work hard, then we have to do an RCT, right? A randomized control trial. So we have to create a setup where, or in other words, if you want to test whether the direct effect of a bonus is, is uh, motivation, and, and better performance, then we have to create an RCT. That means randomly chosen people are offered bonuses and another control group is not offered any bonuses. And that is absolutely made clear to the agents. If you create that setup, then the what is happening in this model won't happen, right? The agents won't infer uh, what their productivity is from the contract they have been offered because the contracts were chosen randomly. So if to, to affect, to, to look at the direct motivating effect of bonuses, you have to create an RCT. You cannot take it from, from actual business data because there's a selection effect going on there. So in the real world, things are happening like this model. Agents are being strategically chosen for bonuses and performance pay. So this tells us that, you know, how we interpret evidence, of course, depends on theory. Right? Theory and empirical strategies are not unrelated to each other. Um, last thing, well, last couple of things. Uh, one interesting observation is that, you know, you could do a comparative statics exercise. What happens if alpha increases? Alpha increasing is like the agent's self-confidence going up. Yes. Um, um, so you can find that the ex ante probability of no bonus, no bonus being offered, um, goes up if if alpha goes up, right? So so when the agent is initially much more self confident, there's a greater chance that the principal will take a gamble and not offer a bonus. Yeah. Anyway, let me move to the last point, which is absolutely key. So suppose there are two periods and there are two different principles in the two periods, same agent, two different principles. In the first period, the principal came. So it was a manager and the manager was interested in maximizing profits for the first period. So the manager saw a worker who's low ability and offered him a bonus. In the process, the low ability guy learns that he's low ability. Right, um, and in the next period, the next principle—if the next principle doesn't offer a bonus, 
then the performance will fall because the good, the bad news learned from the first period will persist. Let me go back to the example in the, you know, that daycare center example. In fact, let me talk about both the, both the examples. Um, let me talk about the nuclear waste facility example, right? You guys remember that example? In, in yes, sir. Switzerland, when they were not offering financial incentives to the town, a majority said that they're willing to accept this facility. When they were offering such incentives that, that went down, now a majority were against it. And we were trying to, you know, we were, uh, brainstorming why that might be the case. Here's a story uh, sort of looking at through the lens of this model. They didn't know the exact risk. Yes. So initially they were taking some average. They were, you know, read up a little on the internet or whatever and they assessed a certain risk. So they were weighing their, you know, sense of nationalism that, you know, we have to, all of us have to make some sacrifices for the national interest against the risk of a spillage or some, some accident happening. Now, then when the central government came and started offering these tax incentives to the town, one reasonable reaction is, uh, why are they offering us uh, so much money? And one inference may be that, oh, it's actually very risky and nobody one else wants to take it. And that's why they're desperate and they're trying to offer us, you know, huge tax incentives. So the contract itself perhaps conveyed negative information about the risk level, which the town initially didn't know for sure. And they revised their beliefs uh, about that in an adverse way, right? And that's, that's how that perverse or uh, counterintuitive effect may have uh, come up, right? Um, for the daycare center, you can try to fit it into this mold also, I guess. Uh, for example, suppose the parents did have some, um, some desire to, to not be totally selfish, to also think about the staff and their inconvenience if they stayed late. But they didn't know how much it mattered to the staff. Right, so one possibility is that they anyway, you know, if it gets over at four, they anyway hang out, hang out and sip tea and do some gup shop till five or five thirty, and then go home anyway. In which case, you know, coming late doesn't matter that much. Uh, but maybe they have to rush home. They have important things to do at home. So most days they're really desperate to go home at four. In which case, the delays are very costly for them. So when they introduce small fines, that may be a signal that the the cost of delay on the staff is not very high, right? I was thinking, oh, I'm causing a lot of inconvenience and now they're charging me five rupees for coming late by now. So now I think, you know, no big deal. Right? I've learned that uh, their time is not that valuable. So that's again, the kind of negative thing that may arise. Notice that in all of those these examples, there's some degree of intrinsic motivation, right? Why? Because in the daycare example, people are not entirely selfish, right? They they balance their own interests and the interests of the staff. Uh, if they think that it's really very, very onerous for the staff, they probably won't do it or try to avoid it. Similarly, in the case of the town, they are, they have some, they're not entirely selfish. Right? They'll, they'll take on some risk for the sake of the national interest. So again, that's intrinsic motivation. So in the case of, in context where there's intrinsic motivation, people have an independent reason to do the right thing. We have to be very careful about generating extrinsic motivation through monetary rewards and penalties. It may crowd out some of the intrinsic motivation and sometimes it may crowd it out to such an extent that you know the effect will be counterproductive, right? So these, so, okay, the reason I went back to the daycare example, remember there was something really, really, curious, which is that even after the fines were withdrawn, the effect persisted. It didn't go back to old levels. The effect went in the wrong direction and it was persistent, right? And that's exactly what you would observe, you would expect if the contract itself is con conveying some bad news, like over here. Like if bonuses tell employees that their 
uh, talent levels are not that high, then after withdrawal of the bonuses, their performance really would fall. Yeah. And there would be a permanent effect of, of the bonus offer, which is which is negative. Questions? Okay, let me uh, wrap it up. I don't have that much time. So let me look at the last part. Uh, again, if you go back to your textbook, Moral Hazard Theory, it says that, you know, flat wages are useless. It is bonuses which motivate and generate incentives, right? Isn't, isn't that, wasn't that the takeaway? Companies may still want to pay some amount, some component which is a flat wage but that's only for insurance purposes, right? If all the compensation is in the form of a bonus, sometimes the agent will just, you know, in spite of hard work will be hit with bad luck and then the agent's income will re really plummet. And if the agent is risk averse, that, that has a cost. And the company tries to stack, strike a balance between incentives and insurance by paying a flat wage component and a bonus component. But the flat wage component itself creates no incentives whatsoever. That's the idea. You will get it anyway, so why bother, right? Now, in this kind of an informed principle model problem, that's the other funny thing and interesting thing to see. Uh, even flat wages can be motivating. Yes. So the coach could say, the two kids, the coach says, okay, to the first kid that, uh, that, uh, I'm giving you a car right away. Whether you make it to the Indian team or not, I don't care. It's an unconditional reward. To the other kid, he says, okay, I'll give you a bike if you, if you succeed, if you make it to the top team, right? If you allow for both flat wages and bonuses, you can have a fully separating equilibrium where the high types are paid flat wages and the low types are paid bonuses. And both types are motivated to work hard. So the inefficiency goes away, right? It's a separating equilibrium. So whoever gets the car unconditionally learns that the coach thinks I'm the next goalie and that makes him work hard. And whoever gets the bonus learns that I'm not the goalie, but there's a huge performance bonus on the table. So, so that bonus in itself makes the agent work hard. Right. So flat wages can also play a role in uh, conveying information and in fact, increasing efficiency overhaul. Now, uh, the technical details are here, right? We can calculate the exact sizes. So, so these are the details. Um, a, L, A, so, so A is the flat wage component, B is the bonus component. So in general, high types are given some AHBH and low types are given some ALBL. And here are the exact values which will make it a separating equilibrium. So basically low types are not given any flat wage whatsoever. And they're paid that minimum bonus, if you remember, that B star. And the high types are given no bonus whatsoever. And they're get given a flat wage, which is this amount, okay? And we can show that all the incentive constraints, everything is satisfied, okay? So basically two incentive constraints have to hold when it's a high type, the principal ought to choose the contract which is supposed to give the high type, namely this, a flat wage contract. And when the principal sees it's a low type, this should be theta L, it's a typo. Uh, when he sees it's a low type, it should be in the principal's interest to offer the contract suitable for the low type, which is a bonus-based contract, right? And we can show that if the parameters satisfy this, uh, this kind of separating equilibrium exists, right? Let me just give you the intuition without uh, plotting through uh, these inequalities term by term. Um, essentially for the separating equilibrium to work, it has to be the case that the principal finds it cheaper to motivate the high type agent with a flat wage and motivate the low type agent with a bonus, right? 
So the, the company is saying to some people that uh, we offer you a salary of you know, 50,000 rupees a month. And to some others, they are saying, uh, whenever there's success, we'll pay you one lakh. But when there's no success, we'll not pay you anything. And the way the separating equilibrium works, that the low types are paid, made that bonus offer, and the high types, the more talented types, the ones who are who succeed more often if they work hard, they are paid the flat wage. So why is that? What's the economic intuition? Why why can you create some separation like this? Anyone want to take a guess? So here's the, here's of, the yeah because of different probabilities of success. That's right. Like, yeah. yeah. So if the flat wage is fifty thousand rupees and the bonus is one lakh according to the parameters, the cost of offering a flat wage and motivating the worker that way is type independent. So whoever is off, being offered the fifty thousand flat salary will think they are the high type, whether that's true or not, and they'll work hard. So motivating an agent through fat, flat wages is always costs the principal 50,000. What about the expected cost of a bonus offer and motivating people that way? Once again, whoever offers the, gets the bonus, thinks that he's a low type, but the bonus is good enough to, to encourage hard work, right? So let's say the low type has a 40% chance of succeeding and the high type has a 60% chance of succeeding when they work hard, right? So if you offer the high type, the one lakh bonus, then your expected cost is 60,000 rupees. So it's cheaper to motivate them through flat wages, 50,000. If you offer the low type, the bonus, given that they have a 40% chance of success, you only pay the bonus when they succeed. So your expected cost in that case would be just 40,000 rupees. And that's less than the 50,000 uh, flat wage. So the cost, the expected cost of motivating people with bonuses goes up the higher their type. And that's what is allowing us to create this sort of separation that, that uh, different kinds of contracts are offered to different agents and, and the information is revealed by the principal that way. All right. Okay, any questions? Right. So to wrap up, you know, what is special about this framework is the assumption that there is some intrinsic motivation. And the, and the biggest takeaway is that when people, even without extrinsic motivation, without rewards and penalties, to some degree uh, have a motivation to do the right thing, to do the somewhat non-selfish -self act, uh, to, to act in the interests of larger society, right? In some context, if we think that that element is present in some significant degree, then we have to be very, very careful in, in crafting our uh, rewards and penalties, right? Um, yes, so some schools in the US have this scheme that, you know, kids are paid for every book that they read. Yes, school children. And that has been criticized a lot because what kind of message does that convey, right? The kid doesn't know, he's just figuring out the world and, you know. So if the kid is told that every book you read, it will pay you 100 rupees, we have to pass a test to, to make sure that you re actually read the book. That tells the kid that, you know, reading is not pleasurable. It's not its own reward. That people read for money, right? And so in the short run, you may get more reading. The, the kids in class may read some more books because you're offering this reward. But in the long run, it may prevent the developing the love of reading and thinking that reading is something which is important and valuable for its own sake. So over the lifetimes, they may read less. In, in that school year, they may read more, All right? So that's again, uh, something like this. You want to encourage the intrinsic motivation to read. 
So, so be very careful about offering extrinsic rewards for that. Sir? Yes. So, so if I get it correctly, uh, the major problem here is that the incentive is mm -hmm. also acting as some source of information which is private to the principal to begin with, but yeah. the incentive reveals that information in some sense to the agent. Yeah. So in principle, if it were possible in an environment for the, for the designer, say for the principal to separate these two. So what provides the incentive to work hard for that matter is not what also conveys information about type. Then this problem would disappear. Is it? Um, Yes, but but how will you do that, right? So so, uh, um, um, the one way in which the principals try to motivate the good agents, the high type agents in this framework, is uh, by somehow or the other conveying to them that they're high types. And then you can get, get them to work hard for cheap, right? If you find a way of telling them or credibly conveying to them that they're high types, then they'll work hard anyway due to their intrinsic motivation. But the flip side of that is that, you know, at the same time, you're also telling the low types that they're low types. There's no way you, in which you can increase the self-belief of the high types without decreasing the self-belief of the low types, right? Yes. It is part of the same package. Now, a very benevolent uh, principle, not a profit maximizer, right? But, but a benevolent uh, principle may, um, may offer bonuses, big fat bonuses to everyone. And then that conveys no information. And uh, so in many of these stories, you know, there's one paper I'll talk about later. The problem often arises with bonuses and incentives which are uh, designed to keep costs down. So you don't want the incentives to be very, very strong, right? If you have the funds and the ability to pay million dollar bonuses for, for everything, then, you know, That'll work. Then the sheer size of that incentive will, will overpower everything else. But when the principals try to save on costs by partly motivating, you know, more talented agents or in more favorable conditions that, oh, you know, just um, there's, there's enough reason for you to work hard, uh, even without money, then that automatically will have a flip side. When, when they don't do it, and when they start sort of giving out bonuses and incentives, then, then it necessarily conveys bad news in those cases, right? So it's impossible to decouple the two. Yes, Arnav, that, does that sort of- Yes, sir, yes. Okay, so I think people are dropping off um, past time, so uh, I'll stop here and uh, for I, I have hopefully been able to record. I actually missed recording the previous uh, session, but I didn't cover that much. So this one should be recorded. So I'll send it to you guys, share it with you. Sir, uh, uh, sir uh, yeah. one question. Sir. Yeah. So so the my question is uh, something out of the course you are teaching right now. So. I, am, I, want, I want to ask here, right, uh, so in the moral hazard theory, when we like, uh, you are like a, uh, the theory is like a uh, formulated on the probability, like a, we, we have to define some probability, like uh, for the Bayesian updation you just now mentioned about. So for that, we need to know the probabilities, like a, what, what will be the prior probability, then we can know the posterior probability, right? So we have to know. So, so I studied somewhere like uh, in some cases, like uh, we don't know the exact probability. So, yeah. So, so, so your question is uh, often in these incomplete information models, uh, we assume that everybody doesn't know the same thing uh, at one level, yes. but 
uh, at a deeper level, we assume that they know the same thing. So for example, we'll say, you know, here we are saying that the realization of theta is not known to the principal agent alike, but yeah. the probability distribution over the two types is known to all of them symmetrically, right? So yes, at, yes. at a deeper level, there's, there's symmetric information. And you might say that, oh, what if they don't even know the probabilities in the same manner, right? Yes. yes. But then you can say, okay, the probability. Sir, uh, I, I, wait I, I a minute. Wait a minute. Let, let me let me oh, finish. Oh, okay, okay, listen, okay. listen to the end of it, and then then uh, you can uh, react to that. So, okay. so one might say, oh, we need a model where even the probability distributions are not known, but the probability distributions themselves are drawn from some probability distribution, right? So the real value could be a uniform distribution between zero one or between 0 0.1 to 1.1, et cetera. Or it could be normal distributions whose uh, mean variance parameters are themselves drawn from some distribution. So you can, you can dig another level and say that, well, the asymmetric information goes more than two levels down. It goes down to a third level that, that the probability distributions are themselves drawn from probability distributions, which are common knowledge, that higher order probability distribution is common knowledge. And then somebody may start quarreling with that, and then you go to a fourth order probability distribution, right? So John Harsani sort of uh, laid the foundations of this, right? This is what is called turtles all the way down problem, right? That uh, somebody said, you know, uh, uh, oh, the world rests on a turtle. So our earth is being carried by a turtle. Uh, that's why, you know, it doesn't sort of crash. And then somebody said, Where's the turtle resting on? <laughs> on another turtle, that was a reply. And they said, well, where does that turtle rest? Well, it's turtles all the way down, right? So that's a that's a kind of a metaphysical joke. So it's so so you can think of many layers of turtles. You can say, okay, I, I want to write down a more complicated model where the probability distributions are themselves drawn from probability distribution. It's all right. <laughs> Right? You can do the same sort of analysis by creating multiple levels, right? You can, you can always do it, but there has to be some starting point somewhere that, so, so you can, you know, you can think of one philosophical sort of uh, thing about asymmetric information, right? In one way we may want to conceive of it is to say that, look, on everything at some point we were equally knowledgeable or equally ignorant. And then some people got more knowledge, more insight, right? and some others didn't, but we can all think back to a time, a point in time where, so for example, in the, in the cricket academy, the coach had the same information about the young cricketer before they met, before the coach saw them, saw him practice, right? So we can think back to a time when uh, the information was, was identical and that becomes our uh, prior, our probability distribution. Yes, Mayu, go ahead. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, so, uh, can we like uh, can we define when we when we uh, don't know what is the probability distribution? Like you said, the turtle problem, the Hudson ID. So, in that case, can we say that that uh, we are in an uncertain position? Like, can we define that like a uh, when we are quantifying risk? So, in that case, we know the probability, right? In the risk, quantifying the risk actually. But in an uncertain situation. We don't know, like uh, in uncertainty, we don't know the probability, like what will be the probability? So can we define so, that so as an uncertain situation? So Har what I'm saying is that, you know, the framework that we adopt takes this approach that if there's uncertainty about what is unknown, if we dig down another level, if we start talking about probability distribution over probability distributions, it may be reasonable to say that 10 levels down, there is common knowledge. Right, so, so some probability distribution of a probability distribution of a probability distribution was drawn, you know, when nobody knew anything at all. Everybody was in the dark. And at that point, perhaps it, we may be justified in saying that, well, everybody believes in the same distribution, right? Okay, so sir, so there is a, uh, there should exist a stage, right, where we, we all have a common knowledge, right? It, it's partly a metaphysical issue. It's not entirely, you know, it's not like arithmetic that we can prove or disprove it, right? But the point is that if, if you could create a more complicated model, it will 
give us the same results qualitatively, the same insights. Uh, it just will have these extra layers. Now, somebody might say that, look, there's, it's turtles all the way down and we never start from, have a common starting point. But that, that debate is philosophical. The, you shouldn't take literally the fact that, you know, uh, that we have only created a one layered model, that the random variables outcome is not known to everyone, but its distribution is known to everyone. I can create a more complex model with similar results where I create two layers of probability distribution. And start from common knowledge from a from a lower level, right? But I'll 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 be able to generate the same kind of results and incentives uh, and, and insights. So so this kind of layering problem will not change our intuition and the results we derive. No, as long as long as you are comfortable believing that there is one is reasonable, one can reasonably assume that there is a bottom layer 10, 10 layers deep or twenty layers deep or whatever. Okay, sir. sir uh, another one, sir. Uh, when do we uh, solve the moral hazard problems and like this kind of discussions we do, we generally assume that the agent is risk averse, right? So we didn't uh, assume it. Yeah. So now, nah, so I am saying that uh, many, many, many the articles they assume that uh, the agent is risk averse. So, uh, so the, the this agent should not may not be risk averse like a may be risk loving so is there any uh, like a any purpose of assuming this aversion in the in this all this all these cases the purpose is clear when when in a moral hazard sort of a standard model which doesn't have any of these uh, exotic features like you know an informed principle etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, if if the agents are risk neutral, the solution, the optimal contract is very very simple. The agent is made the residual agent, right? That maximizes incentives and you know makes everything first best, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So the only reason you may not go all out on incentivizing the agent is risk aversion. So that's why in standard model hazard models you you. Uh, uh, have, have risk aversion because then the problem becomes somewhat interesting and uh, one has to strike a balance between insurance and incentives. In these models that we're looking at, in all the models, the team models and this model, we throughout we have uh, assumed uh, risk neutrality, right? And the reason we are assuming risk neutrality is there's enough other elements to make it interesting. So for example, here, even with our risk neutral agents, some agents are not offered these bonuses and some others are. Right, so bonuses are withheld from some agents, whereas in a standard kind of moral hazard theory, the only reason you know the the principle will not max out on these bonuses is agent risk aversion. Here we don't even need that. There are enough other interesting things flying around so that whether a bonus is good to 